All right, welcome back. Uh, so we have been hitting digital inputs hard. Uh, now you can see that we've kind of changed the focus. So these uh, little icons are super small. Um, and um, a few other things is the focus of this lecture. The way this unit works is each module, so M1, it uses digital inputs to control something. Um, in M1, it's to control LEDs. Um, in M2, it's to control sound. So this is just a, a view from the bottom to see the speaker. In M3, it's to control the screen, so kind of the angry eyes here. Uh, and then M4 and M5 uh, are to make the arm go up and down. So those are the a few other things that we're sneaking in uh, to the digital inputs unit. So M1, uh, M1 is working with buttons, the states, uh, and then the output are the LEDs. The LEDs, uh, they display kind of on the front here. Here they're shown in green. Uh, they're, they're pretty super simple. Um, so this guy has uh, two LEDs, one on the left side, one on the right side. Um, and it's kind of like your left, your right. So not the robots, but like it's next to the left button, right? It has a red, green, bicolor LED on this side, red, green, bicolor LED on that side. You can make the LED be green or red um, or some mixture of the two. Uh, same way with the other side, green or red or some mixture of the two. The syntax uh, is pretty simple here. Uh, it's a function call. So not a method. Uh, so we're just calling the function set color. That set color, um, it's not a function you wrote. It's kind of like math.sign is a function, right? It's in the package um, ev3.leds. So in the same way that sign was in the package math, uh, this is a function that's in the package LEDs, right? Set color receives two arguments. The first is which LED, either left or right. Uh, the second is what color. Um, and the color can be red or green, obviously. It turns on the red, it turns on the green. Um, or there's a couple things that are mixtures. Um, so one of those mixtures is orange. You can see that there's amber, orange, and yellow, and they're just different amounts of mixtures. Turns out, I can't tell the difference. Like, I can see red and I can see green. Uh, but man, amber, orange, and yellow, eh, they all look the same to me, right? Um, so here's an example of right and left, and then here's an example of left and right. Uh, the other color, oh, by the way, the other color is black. Can you guess on what black uh, does? It just turns it off, right? So it's, it's not really black, it's just off. Um, so set color, that's the only method we really use. There's one other convenience method, and that's the method uh, all off, and that just turns them both to black. So instead of writing, um, you know, left, black, right, black, uh, much shorter, you can just say all off, it'll turn them off for you. So we're going to be using button states uh, in M1, uh, and we're also going to be learning about the LEDs. They're simple. You'll be a master by the end of M1. In M2, uh, we're going to be moving to button events, so we're kind of doing whatever on the digital side, but we're going to be working with sound. Um, and mainly M2, by the way, it's just like example code for you. Uh, but I want to talk, tell you about the API. So there's four methods, uh, sorry, four functions uh, that are in the sound package. Uh, dot beep, you already know. Whenever you say dot beep, you can add to the end a dot wait or not. Um, if you say dot wait, it'll wait for it to finish before code keeps going. If you don't add it, it'll just kind of flow through. Here, it would just kind of flow through. The next thing would be sound dot speak. Um, and here it would say ready. Um, typically, you want to pause code when you speak. So you say dot wait. Uh, by the way, this code, if you ran it, would yell at you because it would try to beep and speak at the same time. Um, and it would say, like, audio device already being used or something like that. Beep, speak, you already know those. Let's introduce some new ones. Dot tone, uh, it plays kind of like a piano key, right? So um, here it's playing 440, which I think is an A, uh, for 200 milliseconds. So just go beep, um, and it would wait until it's done. If you want to play a song, um, you still use tone, but you do it sneakier. Um, and what you do is you pass in a list. Um, and each item in that list is a tuple um, of three items in the tuple. Love, love, love how well this class, or uh, this project ties into the rest of the class, right? So we've got a list, which we know about list, a tuple, we know about tuples. Um, and this tuple is what frequency do you want to play? How long do you want it to play that sound for? Um, and then do you want a short pause before you play the next sound? Um, and that's the way, like, if you listen to piano or a musical instrument, they, they kind of play that one 
and then there's actually kind of like a, a really brief pause before the next one plays typically. So you pass in a list of tuples, you can make some cool songs. Um, there's a Darth Vader one that, that, that uh, I borrowed from somebody else, and it sounds really good. You can't do chords, but you can make some great sounding songs uh, with tone here. The last one is dot .play. You can actually just play a WAV file. For whatever reason, that feels like cheating to me versus making a song with tones. Um, if you play a WAV file, that WAV file has to be a very specific file format. It has to be this PCM sign 16-bit little Indian thing. If you've got an MP3 file and you want to play it, there are conversion tools. Uh, here's a link to one that you can convert it into the right kind of WAV file. Um, and so typically the only sound I ever play is the Everything is Awesome song, uh, which you've heard. M3. So LEDs, pretty easy. Sound, pretty easy. Um, M3 is the screen. The screen gets a little more complicated, um, but what we're going to do is keep it simple. Um, so the screen, you can display anything on it, just like your computer screen. You can display things on it. It's black and white, um, but to be honest, we're not going to invest a lot of time into the screen. The only thing I'm going to show you is displaying full screen images. That's it. We're just going to keep it light and simple. Uh, the syntax for displaying a full screen image is uh, you have to import uh, the image uh, class. You have to construct an LCD instance. So this is kind of like how motors worked or the digital inputs worked. Um, so you have to construct an LCD screen. You have to construct an image by opening a file. Uh, this file, um, I've got a bunch of images for you, by the way, um, is exactly the right size to fit on the screen. Uh, there's a ton of different images in there you can look through in your assets folder in your kit project uh, this one is called angry eyes once you've got the image and once you've got the lcd screen you can uh, put it on the screen um, so you say screen uh, dot image dot paste there's a lot you can do with the screen which is why it's got like a dot image uh, helper class right um, and you paste in uh, so you call that method it receives two parameters the first one is the image the second is a tuple of the location. Um, and the tuple here is just zero, zero. Um, and then you have to say dot update to make it actually draw the screen. Kind of complex, but it's pretty easy to pattern match. And the only thing you ever have to change is the name of the file you're displaying. There is more you can do with the screen. You can display text in different fonts. Um, you can do things like later we'll do like a dice game with it. Um, but the only thing I really care about you learning right now is full screen images. There is another complexity though, uh, and that's that the screen is also used by the Brickman program, right? So this is the uh, the Brickman program where you can like, go to the file browser, network settings, things like that. Brickman runs at the same time your code runs. So if you try to write to the screen and Brickman tries to write to the screen, they kind of battle, right? So um, we have to fix that somehow. Three solutions. Solution number one, um, Mark the file as an executable, so that's the Chmod plus X. Uh, hopefully we've talked about that before. Uh, and then you can run it from the Brickman's file browser menu. When you run something from Brickman, Brickman is smart enough to stop Brickman while it's running, right? So that's one way you can stop Brickman. I never do that, to be honest, because you have to find it in the file browser, um, and then you don't get logs. So I never do option one. Option number two is you temporarily turn off Brickman, and we'll show you how to do that in a minute. Um, and so you do your work with Brickman off. That's that's kind of the best solution, right? It's the most elegant. Um, option three is that you just let them battle. Um, so it turns out that when you write something to the screen, you'll see it up there, maybe even for like a second before Brickman takes it back over. Um, and it turns out that you could check off M3 with them just kind of battling, and it would be fine. So chmodding, uh, this is a review of things we've done. You mark it as an executable, and then you can run it from the screen. Uh, hopefully you know how to do that already. Um, there's pros and cons. It's annoying to navigate to it, and there's no logs. Uh, the pro is, eh, if, it, if, it, if it works, and you know it works, it's a good way to do a demo, right? Because you don't need a computer, you can just run it. What I do, what I do is I stop Brickman. Uh, there's a command for stopping Brickman. You have to type it into your SSH terminal. And that command is sudo, so that means run as the root with administrator privileges. Um, chvt, that stands for change virtual terminal. Um, and then uh, the parameter is six. So to 86 something means to kick it out. So they pick six for like stop Brickman, right? So kick it out for a little bit. 
If you stop Brickman, uh, the screen will just kind of go blank at first, but then it won't get in your way. So what I recommend you do is you run this command to stop Brickman when you're ready to do M3. You work M3, however long it takes to do M3, you can run it multiple times. Uh, but then at the end of M3, I recommend you restart Brickman. Uh, to restart Brickman, it's the sudo chvt1. Um, and once you restart Brickman, then Brickman will be back in control, right? Um, and the password, by the way, is, is shown here. Brickman is important to restart at some point because Brickman's how you're going to turn off your robot. If you forget to restart Brickman, you might also forget to turn off your robot, and that'd be bad. So that's the screen. More you could learn about it, uh, but now you know the concepts. Final, um, plus other things, is arm movements. This is where we're going to learn about the touch sensor. We're also going to move this one into the library. Most of the arm movements is actually with motors. Um, so here we say, like, uh, arm motor, uh, run forever at max speed, uh, going up. I like max speed because anything slower, it just it sounds like the, the motor's really struggling, so I just go at max speed. Keep running forever um, while the touch sensor is not pressed, right? So while it's not pressed, keep on coming up. Um, and then as soon as you hit it, um, exit the while loop. Um, so the while loop will just end and then stop the motor. And I chose to stop it quickly, right? So I chose to break stop it in this case. While the while loop is running, don't do anything. Just kill time. Kill, kill a tenth of a second, right? Or a hundredth of a second. Um, once the touch sensor is pressed, then stop the motor right away. So it's kind of the uh, the the run forever. Um, usually we use a time dot sleep, uh, but here we're doing an indefinite loop where it's checking the sensor. So uh, another good example of an indefinite loop, which again ties really well into the, the class material, right? And then we stop. Interestingly, there's no sensor on the bottom, so the only way you know how to stop at the bottom is that, that it's actually 14.2 uh, revolutions of this motor exactly to get to the bottom. Uh, so you just you touch the top and then you go 14.2 revolutions down. Of course, you have to convert that into degrees, so it's like 5,000 degrees or something. You can totally do it. Uh, so that's the touch sensor in the arm. Once you've got that skill, then you're ready for the final project for this unit, uh, which is the IR remote which ties together uh, the digital inputs on the remote, um, the digital input uh, on the buttons, because we use backspace. Uh, it ties together LEDs, it ties together arm movements. Uh, it reviews what you know about the drive motors from the last unit. Um, it does not cover the screen, but that's okay. We did plenty of stuff with the screen before. Uh, so that's what this uh, unit is all about. Uh, and so hopefully at the end of this, you'll understand the user's inputs, uh, which are primarily digital. So like the, the remote and the buttons. Uh, you'll also understand uh, the touch sensor, which is crazy simple to use, um, and a few other things. All right, uh, go to uh, actually learning this stuff by doing it uh, and working these modules with your team. All right, good luck. Bye. Mm -hmm.